internet's like this new human experience. At first, everybody's gonna like it, but there will be a fundamental change in the human condition. Time goes by, you're really becoming in these more constrained virtual boxes, where every action will be counted. One day we're all gonna wake up and realize that we're just servants. It is Thursday, March 10th, 6.18 p.m. I'm going to read Chapter 0 of Part 3 of Book 4, The Magical Theory of the Universe. There nicht ist, only nothing is, Comte de Chevalerie. There are three main theories of the universe, dualism, monism, and nihilism. It is impossible to enter into a discussion of their relative merits in a popular manual of this sort. They may be studied in Erdmann's History of Philosophy and similar treatises. All are reconciled and unified in the theory which we shall now set forth. The basis of this harmony is given in Crowley's Bereshith, to which reference should be made. Infinite space is called the goddess Nuit, while the infinitely small and atomic yet omnipresent point is called Hadith. I present this theory in a very simple form. I cannot even explain, for instance, that an idea may not refer to being at all, but to going. The Book of the Law demands special study and initiated apprehension. These are unmanifest. One conjunction of these infinites is called Rahur Kui, more correctly Heri Raha, to include Horpur Krat, a unity which includes and heads all things. The basis of this theology is given in Liber 220, A.L. Vellegis, which forms part four of this book four. Here I can only outline the matter in a very crude way. It would require a separate treatise to discuss even the true meaning of the terms employed and to show how the Book of the Law anticipates the recent discoveries of Frege, Cantor, Poincare, Russell, Whitehead, Einstein, and others. There is also a particular nature of him in certain conditions, such as have obtained since the spring of 1904. This profoundly mystical conception is based upon actual spiritual experience, but the trained reason can reach a reflection of this idea by the method of logical contradiction, which ends in reason transcending itself. All advance in understanding demands the acquisition of a new point of view. Modern conceptions of mathematics, chemistry, and physics are sheer paradox to the plain man, who thinks of matter as something that one can knock up against. The reader should consult the soldier and the hunchback in conch on Pax. Unity transcends consciousness. It is above all division. The father of thought, the word, is called chaos, the dyad. The number three, the mother, is called Babylon. In connection with this, the reader should study Liber 58 and Liber 418. The first triad is essentially unity in a manner transcending reason. The comprehension of this trinity is a matter of spiritual experience. All true gods are attributed to this trinity. Considerations of the Christian trinity are of a nature suited only to initiates of the ninth degree of OTO, as they enclose the final secret of all practical magic. An immeasurable abyss divides it from all manifestations of reason, or the lower qualities of man. In the ultimate analysis of reason, we find all reason identified with this abyss. Yet this abyss is the crown of the mind. Purely intellectual faculties all obtain here. This abyss has no number, for in it all is confusion. Below this abyss we find the moral qualities of man, of which there are six. The highest is symbolized by the number four. Its nature is fatherly. Mercy and authority are the attributes of its dignity. Each conception is, however, balanced in itself. Four is also Daleth, the letter of Venus, so that the mother idea is included. Again, the sephir of four is Chesed, referred to water, and is ruled by Jupiter, lord of the lightning, fire, yet ruler of air. Each sephir is complete in its way. The number five is balanced against it. The attributes of five are energy and justice. Four and five are again combined and harmonized in the number six, whose nature is beauty and harmony, mortality and immortality. In the number seven, the feminine nature is again predominant, but it is the masculine type of female, the Amazon, who is balanced in the number eight by the feminine type of male. In the number nine, we reach the last of the purely mental qualities. It identifies change with stability. Pendant to this sixfold system is the number 10, which includes the whole of matter as we know it by the senses. 
The balance of the Sephiroth, Kether, one. Kether is in Malkuth, and Malkuth is in Kether, but after another manner. Hakma, two, is Yod of Tetragrammaton, and therefore also Unity. Binah, three, is He of Tetragrammaton, and therefore the Emperor. Chesed, four, is Daleth, Venus, the female. Jabura, five, is the Sephira of Mars, the male. Tifereth, six, is the Hexagram, harmonizing and meditating between Kether and Malkuth. It also reflects Kether. That which is above is like that which is below, and that which is below is like that which is above. Netzach 7 and Had 8 balanced as in text. Yesod 9 see text. Malkuth 10 contains all the numbers. Such is a crude and elementary sketch of this harmony. It is impossible here to explain thoroughly the complete conception, for it cannot be too clearly understood that this is a classification of the universe, that there is nothing which is not comprehended therein. Liber 58, the article on the Kabbalah and the Equinox, is the best which can be written on the subject. It should be deeply studied in connection with the Kabbalistic diagrams in Numbers 2 and 3, the Temple of Solomon the King. Such is a crude and elementary sketch of this system. The formula of Tetragrammaton is the most important for the practical magician. Here, Yod equals 2, He equals 3, Vau 4 to 9, and He final equals 10. The number 2 represents Yod, the divine or archetypal world and the number one is only attained by the destruction of the god and the magician in Samadhi. The archangelic world is under the number three. The world of angels is under the numbers four to nine, and that of spirits under the number ten. It is not possible to give a full account of the twenty-two paths in this condensed sketch. They should be studied in view of all their attributes in 777, but more especially that in which they are attributed to the planets, elements, and signs, as also to the tarot trumps while their position on the tree itself and their position as links between the particular sephiroth which they join is the final key to their understanding. For the principal tables from 777 revised to see Appendix 5. It will be noted that each chapter of this book is attributed to one of them. This was not intentional. The book was originally but a collection of haphazard dialogues between Freighter P and Soror A, but on arranging the manuscripts they fell naturally and on necessity into this division. Conversely, my knowledge of the schema pointed out to me numerous gaps in my original exposition. Thanks to this, I have been able to make it a complete and systematic treatise. That is, when my laziness has been jogged by the criticisms and suggestions of various colleagues to whom I had submitted the early drafts. All these numbers are, of course, parts of the magician himself, considered as the microcosm. The microcosm is an exact image of the macrocosm. The great work is the raising of the whole man in perfect balance to the power of infinity. The reader will remark that all criticism directed against the magical hierarchy is futile. One cannot call it incorrect. The only line to take might be that it was inconvenient. In the same way, one cannot say that the Roman alphabet is better or worse than the Greek, since all required sounds can be more or less satisfactorily represented by either. Yet both these alphabets were found so little satisfactory when it came to an attempt at phonetic printing of Oriental languages that the alphabet had to be expanded by the use of italics and other diacritical marks. In the same way, our magical alphabet of the Sephiroth and the Paths, 32 letters as it were, has been expanded into the four worlds corresponding to the four letters of the name Tetragrammaton, and each Sephira is supposed to contain a tree of life of its own. Thus we obtain 400 Sephiroth instead of the original 10, and the Paths being capable of similar multiplication, or rather of subdivision, the number is still further extended. Of course, this process might be indefinitely continued without destroying the original system. The apologia for this system is that our purest conceptions are symbolized in mathematics. God is the great arithmetician. God is the grand geometer. It is best, therefore, to prepare to apprehend him by formulating our minds according to these measures. By God, I here mean the ideal identity of a man's inmost nature. Something ourselves, I erase Arnold's imbecile and guilty not, that makes for righteousness. Righteousness being rightly defined as internal coherence. Internal coherence implies that which is written, detegitur yod, the yod is uncovered. To return, each letter of this alphabet may have a special magical sigil. The student must not expect to be given a cut and dried definition of what exactly is meant by any of all this. On the contrary, he must work backwards, putting the whole of his mental and moral outfit into these pigeonholes. You would not expect to be able to buy a filing cabinet with the names of all your past, present, and future correspondents ready indexed. Your cabinet has a system of letters and numbers meaningless in themselves, but ready to take on a meaning to you as you fill up the files. As your business increased, each letter and number would receive fresh accessions of meaning for you, 
and by adopting this orderly arrangement, you would be able to have a much more comprehensive grasp of your affairs than would otherwise be the case. By the use of this system, the magician is able ultimately to unify the whole of his knowledge, to transmute, even on the intellectual plane, the many into one. The reader can now understand the sketch given above of the magical hierarchy is hardly even an outline of the real theory of the universe. This theory may indeed be studied in the article already referred to, Liber 58, and more deeply in the Book of the Law and the commentaries thereon, but the true understanding depends entirely upon the work of the magician himself. Without magical experience, it will be meaningless. In this, there is nothing peculiar. It is so with all scientific knowledge. A blind man might cram up astronomy for the purpose of passing examinations, but his knowledge would be almost entirely unrelated to his experience, and it would certainly not give him sight. A similar phenomenon is observed when a gentleman who has taken an honors degree in modern languages at Cambridge arrives in Paris and is unable to order his dinner. To exclaim against the master Therion is to act like a person who, observing this, should attack the professors of French and the inhabitants of Paris, and perhaps go on to deny the existence of France. Let us say, once again, that the magical language is nothing but a convenient system of classification to enable the magician to docket his experiences as he obtains them. Yet this is true also that once the language is mastered, one can divine the unknown by study of the known. Just as one's knowledge of Latin and Greek enables one to understand some unfamiliar English word derived from those sources. Also, there is a similar case of the periodic law in chemistry, which enables science to prophecy and so in the end to discover the existence of certain previously unsuspected elements in nature. All discussions upon philosophy are necessarily sterile, since truth is beyond language. They are, however, useful if carried far enough, if carried to the point when it becomes apparent that all arguments are arguments in a circle. See the soldier and the hunchback, the equinox. The apparatus of human reason is simply one particular system of coordinating impressions. Its structure is determined by the course of the evolution of the species. It is no more absolute than the mechanism of our muscles is a complete type, wherewith all other systems of transmitting force must conform. But discussions of the details of purely imaginary qualities are frivolous and may be deadly, for the great danger of this magical theory is that the student may mistake the alphabet for the things which the words represent. An excellent man of great intelligence, a learned Kabbalist, once amazed the Master Therion by stating that the Tree of Life was the framework of the universe. It was as if one had seriously maintained that a cat was a creature constructed by placing the letter C, A, and T in that order. It is no wonder that magic has exercised the ridicule of the unintelligent, since even its educated students can be guilty of so gross a violation of the first principles of common sense. A synopsis of the grades of the AA as illustrative of the magical hierarchy in man is given in Appendix 2, One Star in Sight. This should be read before proceeding with the chapter. The subject is very difficult. To deal with it in full is entirely beyond the limits of this small treatise. Further concerning the magical universe. All these letters of the magical alphabet referred to above are like so many names on a map. Man himself is a complete microcosm. Few other beings have this balanced perfection. Of course, every sun, every planet may have been similarly constituted. Equally, of course, we have no means of knowing what we really are. We are limited to symbols and it is certain that all our sense perceptions give only partial aspects of their objects. Sight, for instance, tells us very little about so simple a thing as a stone. It is silent about its solidity, weight, composition, electrical character, thermal conductivity, etc., etc. It says nothing at all about the very existence of such vitally important ideas as heat, hardness, and so on. The impression which the mind combines from the senses can never claim to be accurate or complete. We have indeed learnt that nothing is in itself what it seems to be to us. But when speaking of dealing as the planets and magic, the reference is usually not to the actual planets, but to parts of the earth which are of the nature attributed to those planets. Thus when we say that Nakiel is the intelligence of the sun, we do not mean that he lives in the sun, but only that he has a certain rank and character, and although we can invoke him, we do not necessarily mean that he exists in the same sense of the word in which our butcher exists. When we conjure Nakiel to visible appearance, it may be that our process resembles creation, or rather imagination, more nearly than it does calling forth. The aura of a man is called the magical mirror of the universe, and so far as anyone can tell, nothing exists outside of this mirror. It is at least convenient to represent the whole work as if it were subjective, 
it leads to less confusion. And, as a man is a perfect microcosm, it is perfectly easy to remodel one's conception at any moment. He is this only by definition. The universe may contain an infinite variety of worlds inaccessible to human apprehension. Yet for this very reason, they do not exist for the purposes of the argument. Man has, however, some instruments of knowledge. We may therefore define the macrocosm as the totality of things possible to his perception. As evolution develops those instruments, the macrocosm and the microcosm extend, but they always maintain their mutual relation. Neither can possess any meaning except in terms of the other. Our discoveries are exactly as much of ourselves as they are of nature. America and electricity did, in a sense, exist before we were aware of them, but they are even now no more than incomplete ideas, expressed in symbolic terms, of a series of relations between two sets of inscrutable phenomena. Now there is a traditional correspondence which modern experiment has shown to be fairly reliable. There is a certain natural connection between certain letters, words, numbers, gestures, shapes, perfumes, and so on, so that any idea, or as we might call it, spirit, may be composed or called forth by the use of those things which are harmonious with it, and express particular parts of its nature. These correspondences have been elaborately mapped in the book 777, in a very convenient and compendious form. It will be necessary for the student to make a careful study of this book, in connection with some actual rituals of magic, for example, that the evocation of Taftartharath, where he will see exactly why these things are to be used. Of course, as the student advances in knowledge by experience, he will find a progressive subtlety in the magical universe corresponding to his own. For let it be said yet again, not only is his aura a magical mirror of the universe, but the universe is a magical mirror of his aura. In this chapter, we are only able to give a very thin outline of magical theory, faint penciling by weak and wavering fingers, for this subject may almost be said to be coextensive with one's whole knowledge. The knowledge of exoteric science is comically limited by the fact that we have no access, except in the most indirect way, to any other celestial body than our own. In the last few years, the semi-educated have got an idea that they know a great deal about the universe, and the principal ground for their fine opinion of themselves is usually the telephone or the airship. It is pitiful to read the bombastic twaddle about progress, which journalists and others who wish to prevent men from thinking put out for consumption. We know infinitesimally little about the material universe. Our detailed knowledge is so compatibly minute that it is hardly worth reference, save that our shame may spur us to increased endeavor. Such knowledge as we have got it is of a very general and abstruse, of a philosophical and almost magical character. This consists principally of the conceptions of pure mathematics. It is therefore almost legitimate to say that pure mathematics is our link with the rest of the universe and with God. Now the conceptions of God are themselves very profoundly mathematical. The whole basis of our theory is the Kabbalah, which corresponds mathematics and geometry. The method of operation in magic is based on this, in very much the same way as the laws of mechanics are based on mathematics. So far, therefore, as we can be said to possess a magical theory of the universe, it must be a matter solely of fundamental law, with a few simple and comprehensive prepositions stated in very general terms. I might spend a lifetime in exploring the details of one plane, just as an explorer might give his life to one corner of Africa, or a chemist to one subgroup of compounds. Each such detailed piece of work may be very valuable, but it does not as a rule throw light on the main principles of the universe. Its truth is the truth of one angle. It might even lead to error, if some inferior person were to generalize from too few facts. Imagine an inhabitant of Mars who wished to philosophize about the Earth, and had nothing to go by but the diary of some man at the North Pole. But the work of every explorer, on whatever branch of the tree of life the caterpillar is after may happen to be crawling, is immensely helped by a grasp of general principles. Every magician, therefore, should study the Holy Kabbalah. Once he has mastered the main principles, he will find his work grow easy. Salvatore ambulando, Latin, literally, it is solved by walking, i.e. in practice, which does not mean call the ambulance.